Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us for the seminar today. And um, today we're really happy to have uh, Anna uh, Montevicchio. Um, and she is a graduate student here in the Department of Large Animal Clinical Sciences um, and uh, Department of Animal Science uh, faculty are also involved in her work. Um, and she's her primary advisor is Ricardo Chabelle. She's going to be talking to us today about um, some of the really great research that she's been doing. She's got some really interesting data on um, the effects of heat stress during the pre-weaning period on uh, Holstein calves. So Anna, you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you for the introduction. Today I'll be sharing the data I collected during summer 2019 for my master's. Yeah. So for the calf management perspective, um, the major concern is about disease incidence and transmission. And this is affected by inadequate uh, housing conditions. In fact, housing was defined as one of the key aspects to affect health and performance along with um, nutrition and the routine in the calf yard. And because of that, most of re several research were done um, to compare type of hutch materials such as plywood, plastic, or wire. If we should use or not cover to these hutches um, and what type of material you should use. And if, or if we should raise these animals individually or in group pens and which environment we should provide for these animals, if indoors or outdoors. In United States, 37.9% of farmers chose to raise their calves in outdoor individual hutches exposing their calves to extreme environmental conditions. And most of the time outside of the thermal neutral zone and leading the calf to acclimatization change. So meaning that the calf is forced to change its phenotype to adapt to extreme environmental conditions. And these changes can take days or weeks and it just achieved when, for example, the body temperature reaches the same as before the, the stressor. Here in the Southeast region, the extreme environmental condition that challenged the calves is heat stress. Here I have a map uh, that is showing the pre predictions of increasing the number of days which the THI will be higher than 70 for the next century. And as we can see, in our region, this is, will be around six to eight days per decade. That heat stress harms the dairy industry is not new. When we talk about that, we are talking about almost $2 billion um, losses per year. And this estimation is only based on dry and lactating animals. Uh, when we look to these losses, for the dairy replacement categories, we don't have a precise calculation. And this is because the economical model used to calculate the loss uh, was from adaptations for the Finnish beef cattle activity. More than that, when we look into the literature to find the effects of heat stress in calves, we realize the source is really scarce. Only recently, researchers start, started to evaluate um, how the combined um, abatement strategies against his stress would affect calves. And another problem that we have with the data reported is that they conflict between each other. And this is because um, major differences in facilities and housing systems, the weather condition, the age and the length of evaluation for these calves. Thinking on that and about the novelty of the facts, 
we have hypothesized that heat stress abatement through the use of forced ventilation will improve growth and performance and will positively impact animal welfare. And our objectives were to determine the effects of heat abatement through the use of forced ventilations on growth, rectal temperature, respiratory frequency, and health, and evaluate the effects of forced ventilation on air velocity and environmental temperature. Here we have um, overview of Brooks, Brooks Dairy Farm in Valdosta, Georgia. This is the farm where we performed our experiment. Here in the back, we have the dry cows. In the center of the video, we have the lactating animals. And up here, we have close up and maternity pens. The calves are transported from here to one of these two barns. And we chose barn one to be uh, the place where we performed our experiment. And this entire area here represents the farm calf yard. Our experiment had a completely randomized design where female calves were assigned to one of two treatments, being SH, hutching a barn with no cooling, and SHF, hutching a barn with cooling through fence. Here we have an overview of inside the barn. In the top part of the video, we have the pens we use for this experiment. And as the drone is flying, we are approaching 80% shade cloth that we use for divider of treatment. So now we are entering a SH treatment, hutching a barn with no cooling. And once again, we're approaching a, a group of fans. And so we are entering a SHF treatment. With the use of the 80% shade cloths, we had six groups inside the barn, three for each treatment. So in total, we had 125 in the SH treatment and 102 calves in the SHF. And we had two subgroups. One we called feed efficiency, and we have 57 animals in the SH and 45 in the SHF. And the other subgroup we call air quality, and we had 26 animals in the SH and 25 in the SHF. Here is an uh, outline of the entire barn. The black squares represent representing the fence, and the green dots is to is the location where we install the hobo device. They measure every 15 minutes temperature and humidity, and for us to calculate the THI later. For the feed efficiency subgroup, we started our evaluations on day zero when we measure birth body weight, and we follow these animals until day 70 for body weight, rump height, and meter height. From day 14 and day, until day 68, we evaluate feed efficiency, measuring milk consumption and start intake. And for the same animals, we started our evaluations. Uh, we collected blood samples of fecal samples uh, starting on day one, when additionally, we collect a sample for a total serum protein. And we follow until day 65, evaluating health scores and rectal temperature. On days 28 and 42, we vaccinated our animals with booming for further IgG determinations. For the air quality subgroup, we started the evaluations on day five until day 70 for air velocity, environmental temperature, rectal temperature, and respiratory frequency three times in a week, in the morning and the afternoon. For the same animals, we also evaluate health scores just in the morning and twice a week. On weeks five and nine, we also perform air quality evaluations. And that was, uh, airborne bacteria with two types of agar plates, um, one for gram negative bacteria and the other for total, total bacteria counts. And we also measure ammonia concentration. For the air velocity, we use a device called anemometer and we place it at calf level and always facing the fan or facing where the fan should be for the SH treatment. Here is this is the design for the air quality subgroup. So we evaluated two hutches in the farthest positions in relationship to the fan, two hutches in the closest position in one hutch, one hutch in the middle part. 
as in the SH, we don't have a point of reference. We just transfer the same design to one treatment to another. For health score evaluations, we use the Wisconsin calf 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 health scoring chart, and we evaluate we evaluate in nasal and uh, eye discharge, ear cough, rectal temperature, fecal, navel, and joint scores in a range from zero to three. And for our evaluation, we created a score called upper respiratory tract score, and it was the sum of nasal and eye discharge, ear and calf score. We analyze our data using SAS, and for continuous outcomes, we use ANOVA with the random effect ID nested within treatment and barn position. And for metabolite evaluations, we included the concentration on day one in our model. For our, our binomial outcomes, we use logistic regression. And for survival and disease analysis, we use Cox proportion hazard regression and chi-square. And these are our results. At enrollment, we did not uh, detect any differences between treatments regarding them uh, characteristics such as number of lactations, having easy score, or gestation late. And neither we detect any differences between treatments regarding calf characteristics such as total serum protein, birth body weight, birth reader, birth reader height, and birth rump height. This is the THI data we calculated from the Hobo device. And as we can see, the THI for both treatments were really similar during the entire period. And throughout the experiment, uh, we stayed above 68 of THI. And 68 is an important number because it's defined as the heat stress threshold for cows. And here we have the percentage of 15 minutes intervals with THI higher or equal to 72. Once again, it was really similar for both treatments. And as we can see, we spend most of our time in the THI higher or equal to 72. Here I have this outline again, because in our, in, for our air quality subgroup, we included the treatment by hut position in interaction in the model. So we named our positions. The two farthest from the fans we call A and C, the two closest D and E, and in the middle point we call B. When we evaluate uh, air velocity inside the, the hut, we found we found a difference between treatments in the morning and in the afternoon with the SHF treatment having greater air velocity. And in the afternoon, we also found a difference in the interaction treatment by age. And this is because of the magnitude of difference in weeks three, five, and seven between treatments. When we are evaluating also air velocity, we found a difference between treatment by a hutch position in the morning and in the afternoon. And this is because in all positions, um, SHF treatment had greater air velocity than the SH. When we evaluate um, environmental temperature, we found a difference in, in the between treatments in the morning with SH having greater uh, air temperature than SHF, but we did not see this difference in the afternoon. When we evaluate rectal temperature in the animals, we saw a difference between treatments in the morning with SH animals having greater rectal temperature than SHF, but we did not see the, this effect in the afternoon. When we evaluate respiratory frequency, we did not see an effect of treatment or in the interaction for, in the morning or in the afternoon. When we evaluate body measurements and feed efficiency, we did not see an effect of treatment or in the interaction for body weight, average daily gain, hump height, or feed efficiency. And we did not see an effect of treatment for the percentage of animals that doubled their body birth body weight. However, we saw a difference in the interaction treatment by age for weather height. And this is because on days 34 and 47, SH animals were intended to be taller than SHF. 
When we evaluate incidence of fever, we did not see an effect of treatment. However, when we evaluate incidence of hyperthermia, we saw a tendency for the SH treatment having higher amount of cases than SHF. When we evaluate upper respiratory tract score, SH treatment had a greater score than SHF. And evaluating our air quality um, samples on day 33 of age, we found a tendency for the SH treatment have greater gram bacteria counts than the SHF and to have greater ammonia concentration than the SHF. With 63 days of age, we saw the um, effect of treatment to total bacteria counts for with SH having greater counts than SHF and having also SH having greater ammonia concentration than SHF. I'm sorry. And we also detect um, a difference in the interaction tre treatment by Hutch position. And this is because on the position C and D, SH treatment had higher ammonia concentration than the SHF. When we evaluate metabolites, we did not see an effect of treatment or in the interaction for glucose and NIPA concentration, but we saw an effect in the interaction treatment by age for BHB concentration. And this is because on day 58, uh, SHF animals had greater BHB concentration than the SH. We followed these animals daily until day 70 when they were moved to a pasture. Um, until day 70, we did not um, see an effect of treatment and we are still following the, those animals and we intend to follow them until the end of the first lactation. And so far, we still did not detect an effect of treatment um, in body weight. And when we evaluate disease incidence by 18 months of age, we did not uh, see an effect of treatment for cases of bloat, diarrhea, ear infection, lameness, pink eye, or pneumonia. However, when we analyze the data for mortality and hazard ratio of removal, we saw a difference between treatment and surprisingly, um, SHF treatment had higher mortality and greater um, hazard ratio of removal. And we can see the hazard ratio of removal in this graph. Uh, SH is represented by blue and SHF by red. And as you can see, the difference between treatments, it since early age, so the pre-weaning phase, and then the both treatments stabilized and we have a greater dif difference around 200 days. We are still following this animal, so we don't know about the future, the future, but right now what we can see is that SH animals have been removed from the herd in a lower pace than the SHF. With that, we conclude that the environmental conditions during the experiment are representative of heat stress. Commercial silly fans working at 80% of their capacity significantly increased air velocity, but had minor effects on air temperature. Cooling through, fan through ceiling fans had minute effects on rectal temperature, but did not affect respiratory frequency, body measurements, metabolites, or feed efficiency. And to our surprise, Calves in the SHF treatment had greater hazard ratio of removal from the herd by 18 months of age than the SH calves. Thank you very much, and I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Anyone have any questions for Anna? So Anna, why? You measured both rump height and wither height. So why did you decide to do both of those? Because a lot of people just do one. 
and why do you, why was there a difference in one and not the other? Oh, you're still muted. So we decided to do both to be more, would say, precise. So we have more data, and I believe um, we had this difference. Um, we were dealing with sand, so probably it's more human error than anything else. I would okay. say. It looked like there was a tendency for that in the rump height, right? Yeah. Anna, yes. Anna, can I ask a question? <laughs> uh, this is Josette here. Uh, so you you, you provide uh, fans. Yeah, that that was your uh, manipulation out yeah, of the environment. Yes. And you showed that uh, temperature only differ in one of the periods in the day. So you're re really causing conduction and convection there. So. Is it possible that maybe a limitation is that you need evaporative cooling in these calves to really change body temperature? Maybe part of the reason of no effect is because just air may not provide the sufficient cooling, or maybe they just don't need, yeah? Who knows? Maybe they just don't need the additional cooling. Well, hi, Dr. Santos. Um, thanks for your question. So we were discussing that uh, yesterday with Dr. Chabelle. Um, so we still don't know if they need more air because um, we had like one, 1 1.3 meters per second in the calf level. I don't know if more air would affect the temperature or as you said, the combination air and the water mist or soakers I don't know, but we also have this question, if we put um, water in this mix, how would be the environment related to ammonia concentration and bacteria? We still don't know. Um, probably I can, we, this is the next step, evaluating if adding water to this mix would help to see this change in temperature or just more air or a different setup of fins would help with that. So you had a lot of fan power there, yeah? Those are big fans. Yeah, those are six foot wide or maybe larger. Yeah. So more than yeah. most people would provide to a calf barn. Yes, that's correct. Um, and we, Program them to work at 80%, not 100%. But we, they are, they were also programmed to have 2.5 uh, meter per second of air when it was like coming out of the fan. Maybe we could program them to have a higher air speed, like when it's coming out to the fan, we would have greater air velocity at calf level. So Anna, there is a question in the chat from Dr. Deal, um, and she asks you, what is your interpretation of higher mortality rate between the groups? Why do, why do you think that's happened? Well, this is, this is my focus right now to find out why. Um, as we are like still following the animals, I don't have um, the reason why these animals are being removed from the herd. Um, probably I will look more into that and I can answer this question with property, but right now I don't have this answer. Any other questions for Anna? Is this presentation available to uh, review? I, I wasn't able to get into the first part of this, so I had a conflicting, uh, but is this recording available? It, it, it uh, is. Go on. 
Yep. I, I will send this out by email to everyone who okay. was on the email list as soon as we're as soon as I get the um the link back from Zoom. Okay, that's appreciated to be able to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, if there aren't any more, oh, there is more questions. Yep. Uh, I guess I have a question. Do you know of any studies, you know, where you'd add high pressure fog over calves been done to see, because I see you, you're considering that possibility. Is there any studies been done looking at high pressure fog over calves um, as a way of controlling temperature and then keeping that in balance with humidities and the effect on the calves THI? And uh, that almost needs its own separate chart, but I don't know if that's anybody's developed that either for what a, what a calf's THI is compared to an adult cow. So I don't have knowledge about any group that is using the fog or the soakers for calves. Um, the only uh, that I know is using fans and shade um, so, and, but about the THI, uh, there is a um, study and it, it's from Europe. And if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Laporta's group also had a publica publication last year about the THI for calves. The Europe study, they use um, different THIs for different parameters. Uh, for example, for rectal temperature changes, they use 78. It's much more higher than the threshold for, cow, for cows. Um, I'm, I'm not sure about uh, what the recommendation of Dr. Laporta studies are, uh, but these are the two studies that I know. One is from COVAX from 2018, and the Dr. Laporta's group, it's outlet 2020. Is that something we could contact you and get those those papers uh, some way also? Sure. Um, I'm going to ask to Dr. Mansell to put my email in the email with the recording. So if you want to contact me, I can or I can send right now in the chat for you my email. Sure, and uh, that'd be appreciated. Yours. Yeah, or you send yours and I sure. can forward the papers for you for sure. Yeah, if you just post it in general for everybody, the consumption would be great. And then, but uh, be highly interested in uh, carrying on that conversation about uh, high pressure fog. Uh, yeah. Potentiality, you would be quite interested in that. So uh, uh, I appreciate that conversation going forward. So. That's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If there are no other questions for Anna, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and leave it there. Um, she has put her email in the chat. So if anyone wants to get that right now, they can do that. And I'll, I'll also include that in the email that comes out with the recording um, as soon as I as soon as I receive that link. All right. Well thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, Dr. Monsell. And thanks everyone for attending. It's nice to see so many people here and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>